creating the, the link in, on YouTube. Okay, Professor, I'm Dave. I, I believe I'm the, the only one that you haven't met yet. Dr. Rodrigo is connecting with, yeah, with us okay. right now. Uh, and I can hear someone's children. You have to put her up on the screen too. Oh, it's not <laughs> mine. It's probably it's probably Marcia's. Marcia, are you home? I'm here. Are you home? Because I believe your kid is talking on the background. My you niece is you your kid is talking on the background. Okay. No, he's not. I, I'm on the library. It's not mine. Oh, <laughs> it's not mine too. My my leader, money is watching TV. I, I, I will mute my. Uh, Diego, how that's... many kids do you have there? I have no, but uh, I'm in the house of my friend, and there is some people here. <laughs> I was just joking. Okay. <laughs> I, I think you are Diego. No, he got it. He's got it on mute. It's okay. Yeah. Okay, I, th I think we're all seeing the, the screen of uh, Professor Badwar. Sure. Yes. Okay, Gil. First, uh, I think it's, it's, it would be good if, you, if we start with a brief introduction of Professor, and we also show the, our introduction video of the, the program. Sure. We will just wait for the... the the streaming starts and then we go on. Okay. The streaming is okay. Okay. Uh, I put the link on the WhatsApp. Okay. Okay. So let's I'm... share. Let's share the link through WhatsApp. Then everybody can join. Uh... Okay, I will receive the questions in, in the end. I, I, will, okay. I will present the best ones. So there'll be time for discussion afterwards. Yeah, if you still have time, we can, yeah. we can discuss it. If you are available, sir, yeah. you can take a couple of minutes. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, Diego, I will just share my screen for some minutes to, to show our video. Okay. okay. It's... Or maybe I don't need to. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's okay. good. I think someone else, oh yeah, Professor Badwar is sharing his screen. Professor, can you please uh, stop sharing your screen? Okay. Just for us to show a brief video. Yes. Can you see? Yep. Okay, this perfectly. Okay, let's go. Okay, hi everyone. Good afternoon for those one who are in Brazil. Uh, today we have a very special guest, Professor Bedwar is with us. We have an honor to receive him to, to a lecture, very nice lecture. Uh, Professor Bedwar is a cardiac surgeon, surgeon graduated from the University of Ottawa in 93, 
He is also a professor and chairman from the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery and Thoracic Surgery from West Virginia University. And he was also the co-program director for ATS and in Brazil this year. Uh, welcome, Professor. Well, thank you very much, Marcio. Glad to be here with you. Please, make yourself comfortable for sharing your screen. Very good. How about that? Yeah, perfect. <coughs> Does that work for your colleagues? Yeah, it's perfectly. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marcia. It's great, glad to be with you all. And um, I'm looking forward to covering this topic, uh, program development of minimally invasive and robotic mitral valve repair uh, surgery, really looking at maintaining quality at the introduction and then advancing at all levels of complexity. It, in the past, it's known that uh, erotic valve repair or even minimally invasive as it starts is uh, preferred or referred for only the simplest of cases because of increased operative time, perhaps increased complexity, perhaps increased cost. And so the adoption of minimally invasive surgery has been slow. Now, having been a friend to Brazil for over a decade now and been there many, many times, I have very close colleagues in Brazil and throughout Latin America. And I know the level of competency uh, in complex cardiac surgery is very high. And the uh, leadership in minimally invasive surgery is also quite common. So for uh, you and your um, trainee colleagues, um, I thought uh, after speaking with you through email that perhaps this might have some interest. And am I correct? Yeah. Yes. All right. Very good. So um, I have no financial disclosures. The only disclosure that I, I do know, I'm, I'm currently the co-chair of the Tendine Program uh, Global Executive Committee that's operated by Abbott, but I receive no compensation for that. So to begin, um, you've heard this before, I'm sure, when you talk about heart teams, uh, whether that be TAVR or any, uh, or TAVI, uh, any type of introduction of new technology, um, sort of been the buzzword. Uh, it, it's very, very important, however, in minimal invasive surgery. If we go back 10 years or even 20 years when minimal invasive surgery began, and believe me, I'm not going to give a history lesson uh, today. I, I remember being a resident, and I always hated when I got the history part of any presentation. So I'm going to dive right into some details. But if we go back, uh, it was all about the surgeon and trying to do innovative things, but we learned lessons in the, along the way in the early 1990s and mid 1990s and even up to 2000 that without a full good team looking at imaging and looking at cannulation strategy and other, other uh, modalities, that's where the significant errors occurred. And I will start that it's not the minimally invasive technique or the robot itself that can lead to complications. It's not having a team and not being thoughtful of knowing these complications ahead of time and anticipating them through technology and team building. So it's really a philosophy. And that includes surgeons, anesthesiologists, nurse practitioners or nurse technicians, perfusionists, and also the technical aspects of managing single lung ventilation management, if we refer to minimally invasive cardiac surgery, whether that be um, uh, minimally invasive cabbage or robotic cabbage or uh, minimally invasive mitral surgery. My comments throughout this uh, uh, presentation will be leaning a little bit more on the robotic side, but in all honesty, has direct uh, ramifications to uh, minimally invasive surgery at, itself. So once one has a good team, and that's not by any means an easy thing to do, but once one has a good team, 
or you're trained in a good team, particularly if you leave your training and go into practice. This is very, very important because you don't want to fail in your first year after training. But once you get through what's called the learning curve, then one can expand complexity, but also maintain quality along the way. Never uh, ever extend complexity before you can maintain quality, because then you do the patient a disservice and yourself a disservice as well as your facility and uh, your society. And that gets to leaflet techniques, ring management, advancing pathology. So we'll cover all of these. So here are a couple of facts. I'm not gonna hear to say that robotic mitral valve repair makes you see the valve better than you can and therefore makes you a better surgeon. That is uh, erroneous. I know other people say that or the companies might say that, but let's say the truth. Minimally invasive surgery, robotic mitral valve repair is not easier than doing a sternotomy. There is a learning curve, even if you're an expert mitral surgeon. And I know that I believe the audience are in training or in their early years of practice. And so I'm, I'm not expecting you to be an extra expert mitral surgeon, but perhaps you, you are. But even if you're an expert, there's a learning curve. And this is a steeper learning curve than sternotomy and it's all unrelated to the mitral valve. This has to do with everything else but the valve itself. And the best results for minimally invasive or robotic mitral valve repair occur that you, if you're consistent with your same technique that you use in an open operation. In other words, please don't reinvent the operation because you're doing it minimally invasive. This is a way that you can maintain as you advance, that you can do open and minimally invasive the same way and your team knows uh, your techniques. And of course, always a part of team creation, it's never about you, it's always about the team. And please don't forget that as you uh, start your practices and then advance your techniques. So this graphic kind of outlines the training paradigm if your target is to do minimally invasive or robotic te techniques, it's to obviously start with median sternotomy and do a good open mitral valve repair. Then you can even do minimally, if you're, if you're so inclined, you can do a hemi sternotomy and still open repair. And that's either a lower third sternotomy, upper third sternotomy, mainly lower third for mitral, upper third for, for aortic valve, which many of you probably are doing in training. True minimally invasive surgery is actually a mini thoracotomy and peripheral cannulation. The hemisternotomy, you can still centrally cannulate. Mini thoracotomy with peripheral cannulation, and you can start with direct vision. You can just look straight at it. Oftentimes you need a rib spreader, however, to do so. And then graduate to video assistance. And that's uh, using a five French uh, port or a five millimeter port and camera um, and being able to look directly through a video screen at the field and actually perform the repair. And that's using long shafted instruments to still have that connection directly with surgical tactile feedback. Only when you've mastered these things, it's probably appropriate to then migrate to robotic technology because it has to do with telemanipulation, whereby you no longer have the tactile feedback directly and you're using the cues of the tissues. In other words, how the tissue deforms and how it feels with, through the, the, the robot hands itself. And so it can be a very foreign entity. And that's why that learning curve is a steep one if you're not otherwise prepared through this process. This is not something I'm making up. In fact, many of us in the AATS and STS uh, leadership have, have come up with a recommendation that really this, a single cardiac surgeon is the leader of a team. And the team usually is comprised by dedicated cardiac anesthesia and dedicated perfusionists for at least the first 20 cases before you introduce other people, because there's 
accumulation of the team learning. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, yes. And so to have like one anesthesia, one scrub, one perfusionist changing every single time you do each case, uh, it doesn't allow for that team learning to occur, particularly when you start. The surgeon should be have some standard experience, at least 120 career uh, open cardiac operations. In other words, in the, in the left atrium um, with, uh, that, that are not just AVRs or cabbages. And then at least 60 over the two years prior to entering into robotics, 25 of them should be at least isolated mitral valve repairs. So it takes some preliminary experience before you embark on robotics. One needs to try to have a fairly good repair rate for degenerative disease before you embark on doing robotic mitral valve repair because you want it to be successful. Imagine if you were to begin a program and yes, you can do it robotically, but they're all replacements or the repair fails in 30 days or one year. Then one can blame the, the robot, but it, they also, it's also your technique perhaps. So you have to really make sure that you already have some, some good basis. And at least 15 cases of peripheral bypass utilization um, for at least two years in a row. In other words, once a month, just over once a month, doing a, a case that you're familiar with peripheral cannulation or your team is. And that's why the best uh, programs are those that are already doing minimally invasive, either direct vision or um, video assistance to do these procedures. And having these types of procedures, mitral, tricuspid, maze procedures, um, with open techniques are very important. Why do I show this picture? Is that imaging is very important as you advance your techniques. Now for a 25 year old healthy Brazilian woman or man, the imaging is probably not gonna be overly helpful unless they have some congenital anomaly. However, as one ages, this becomes very, very important. And I show this because I give this example, because um, in our program, we, we don't have age as a cutoff. We do almost anybody coming from any, any pathology, and we'll get to that in a moment, but it doesn't really matter, even complex operations. So we did this CT scan. One patient was 82 years old, and one patient was 58 years old. The patient on the left is the 82 year old. And the patient on the left is the one that got robotics. The patient on the right did not get robotics because of uh, atheroembolic disease. So this becomes fairly important as one plans peripheral cannulation. In our technique, we perform bicaval venous drainage. Many programs with direct vision or um, or video assistants tend to use one venous cannula up the femoral vein and peripheral arterial cannulation. However, we feel fairly strongly and many advanced programs have gone to bicaval drainage, but we've been doing this for a long time using bicaval and this is done through the right internal jugular vein. I'll explain why in a moment, but here's the punchline. When you go to a, a robotics, you have a third arm and that third arm is this V retractor. And it, it's not just static. In many minimally invasive programs, it's a static mitral retractor that just gets pulled up. Where the robot arms, it does this all day long, the whole case. You move it around with fingers that you use to adapt. And by flipping like this, it can alter. If you just had one cannula, it can slip out of the SVC very easily. And then you have decreased venous drainage. This is what it looks like. We put this little um, bumper here, we call it, which is a little uh, um, yellow uh, uh, plastic that we utilize to keep that there. And the reason for that is that it allows for avoiding a hematoma at the end of the case. And one day later, we just take that out and it avoids a big bruise uh, from venous uh, stasis at the end of the case. 
while peripheral percutaneous cannulation is definitely possible, and we do this very regular with our TAVI program, we have incorporated the use of a distal perfusion catheter uh, in the right superficial femoral artery at the same time of antegrade uh, arterial cannulation. And we do this through a very small uh, fingernail size incision and direct vision we find is very straightforward. It only takes a few minutes and we've literally almost never had any complications uh, that have to do with peripheral vasculature through this methodology. This is what it looks like. Um, your arterial cannulation, it can be any of the companies that do so. They make very nice cannulas. Um, we tend to use this multi-stage venous cannula because it drains very nicely, um, has multiple holes in it. And this is a perfusion adapter here that allows for the uh, drainage to go distally down the femoral, uh, so down the superficial femoral artery that's inserted. And that we put um, uh, oxygen sensors on both the peripheral um, uh, the extremities, and we look at uh, cerebral oxygen saturations, but also um, uh, peripheral oxygen saturations at the same time to um, ensure, ensure we have the excellent perfusion throughout. For the robotic program, if you were to embark, this is our operating room setup. It doesn't have to be the same thing, but essentially the scrub nurse or technician starts on the opposite side then moves as the, next to the table side. And we have the primary surgeon move to the console and a secondary surgeon here. Oftentimes we have a fellow or other teaching person that can also participate. This is what the standard procedure looks like through a small incision. We do have only one thing through the wound and that's the antegrade um, uh, perfusion catheter. Remember, this is the same setup should you do it under direct vision or video assistance. All we're doing is adding the robot at this point. Now, a lesson to, to do this very safely and very conservatively, this paper by Mark Gilinoff uh, and my friends at, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic uh, that was published in 2018 is really the lesson to utilize for safe uh, commencement of one's program to perform robotic surgery. What this program has done, and they still do, I believe, is they're still fairly selective and it's appropriate to do that to maintain excellent quality. In other words, patients that have um, uh, any aortic insufficiency at all, severe mitral angel calcification, any LV dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension, they're deferred to non-robotic approaches. If they have any um, uh, other issues at all, they're, they're done non-robotically. And so this, this, is a, this is a good pathway to follow for uh, standard conservative approaches. However, once you've passed a learning curve, and this is sort of the next part of what we've been talking about, mm -hmm. is that we believe that it's safe and appropriate to advance that complexity. And so this is just looking at, you know, a, a matched comparison of sternotomy and, and robotic programs, because one of the questions I guess get asked all the time is that what about cost? I know that's very important in Brazil and any country. We looked at uh, type two degenerative repairs. We had a 100% repair rate in both groups. And then we looked at the results at one year with really no residual mitral insufficiency one year. Perfusion time was increased with robotics. However, o operating room extubation was the vast majority in the robotic subgroup. And the total cost was the same. In fact, as you can see there, it's slightly less in robotics. Now, well, let me tell you what that means. In this paper, we utilized the including the cost of the robot. Many other programs don't include the cost of the robot. But we amortized the cost of the robot over seven years, inclusive in the cost, in a technique called activity-based costing. And that's really charging for every four by four, every cannula, every little detail at a real-time manner. And so really, once you've hit the learning curve and then you transition to robotics, you can do so safely without sacrificing short-term outcomes or repair durability at a year, and it can be done cost neutral, um, and that's helpful for uh, your program, your partners, 
and more importantly, your hospital administrators. Now, let's discuss some more practical cases where you know, as you've probably heard, I see from um, uh, Professor Alfieri and Tyrone David in your series, and probably several others, and they've talked about the principles of Alvapair. I'm not going to be duplicative and actually go through those, but I will comment on those. So many of you by now know what systolic anterior motion is and the complexities therein. And so when one assesses the risks of SAM, it's all predictable by the echo. And this is the C-CEP distance, the aortomitral angle, the more acute that is, the more risk of SAM, the shorter the C-CEP distance, the higher risk of SAM. And if the anterior leaflet height to the posterior leaflet ratio is uh, less than one, that's also a high risk of SAM. And so I'm gonna give you a few cases um, that are done robotically that you might look at and say, that's kind of tough to do in a minimally invasive uh, directly uh, fashion. And it's not just your simple P2 resection. So this is a case of a 29 year old patient who has very high predictors of SAM with an acute aeromitral angle, very tall anterior leaflet height. And this is the robotic path pathway. So under um, cardioplegic arrest, we do the initial valve analysis. And one can see that the posterior leaflet is very tall, very redundant. People can call this Barlow's disease, but really this is, um, Carpanche calls this the form frust variety where it's very, very tall. The majority of the pathology is on the, on the posterior leaflet. But we have to do some form of posterior leaflet height reduction. It doesn't start with quadrangular resection. In fact, um, quadrangular resection is really not done that much anymore um, because of its necessity to do a compression of the posterior annulus. In this case, this is a triangular resection to begin. Once a triangular resection is done, you can then do the posterior leaflet height reduction. And that's by undermining the posterior leaflet along the annulus and doing this sliding valvuloplasty. So you can see once that's done, then we place interrupted sutures. It's difficult to do running proline. So this is a suture called Cardionil. Some of you may use it in Brazil. Um, perhaps not. The one thing that's nice about this type of suture that it is actually has some elasticity. So it's actually quite, quite usable in the robotic platform because you can stretch it. And so this is done through interrupted sutures. And once that's completed, then the valve repair is completed. And that's really what this uh, completed valve repair after sliding valvuloplasty should look like. And so even in the most complex uh, sliding valvuloplasty degenerative repairs, robotic repair is quite doable. Now, many surgeons talk about, well, we do things with respectful resection or, I mean, respectful, uh, respect instead of resect. And so why would you use this all the time? Well, here's another uh, example of this, just a, as an open sliding valvuloplasty. I wanna just show you that all of these things are very doable and the entire spectrum of the repair is doable. And that's the annuloplasty sizing. You can do, uh, I'll, I'll show you the full ring insertion. I think the last thing, the last video didn't show that completely. But these are the insertion points of the ring. And so it's not a running suture. It's actually done um, in an interrupted fashion. So let me, let me move on to another case. And this is using cords. So this is a situation where we have a similar, slightly higher risk for systolic anterior motion, but predominantly P2 disease. Now, others talk about using cords for everything, and you can, and cords are quite easy to do in the robot um, using the same techniques you would do in an open case. But I'm showing you this because this is a hybrid technique, a thing that we had called, we published this in JTCVS, um, and we called it respectful resection because it's, you don't 
you, you should never feel that you have to do only one technique. You should be able to do any technique, technique you like. Whatever you think is pathoanatomically directed. What's relevant with this technique is that we use the Gore-Tex cord to actually size it, its insertion. I don't use uh, pledgets or anything like that because it's a passive thing. We could talk about that if there's time for questions. And then actually run the Gore-Tex in two layers. And then that allows for the full rolling of the posterior leaflet into the ventricle and a methodology where you maintain posterior leaflet mobility. And this is very important when you do complex repairs is to always maintain posterior leaflet mobility. And that's your completed repair. You can really do pressure testing to see how that would work. Now, what about anterior leaflet pathologies? As you advance your complexity, oftentimes anterior leaflet repair is seen as difficult. The results aren't as good if you look at long-term published data. And why? Well, in the standard sternotomy technique, it's, it's mainly Gore-Tex cords that are used to um, uh, repair the anterior leaflet. But I wanted to show you some alternate techniques. So this is a 52-year-old gentleman that presents with some decompensated heart failure. You can see the pathology quite clearly there. There's an anterior leaflet flail. Now, importantly, anytime there's a flail of a leaflet, there is a fulcrum or an anchor. So under direct vision with the robot, you can see all the way up. You can even see the aortic valve if you really want to with a camera. But this is a portal transfer. And this is not the chordal transfer of, of the 1990s where you take a healthy piece of the posterior leaflet and bring it forward. This is looking at the robust fan cords that always exist in an anterior leaflet flail, always, um, and moving them from a secondary or tertiary position into the anterior position. Remembering cords like these are only there to support the, the passive retainment. And once that's completed, a rigid remodeling annuloplasty ring is performed. And as you can see there, the, the ring is supporting this. And you see how the anterior leaflet completely unfurls to create that co-optation that's deep. Now, probably the most complicated is once you've mastered all of these different techniques, is to then to embark on things that are a little, a little out there. That's a, sorry for the American phrase, but um, active endocarditis is not something that is traditionally approached robotically. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I am currently in the state of West Virginia. Now, you've probably heard of intravenous drug use due to the opioid crisis, which is a problem I know in your country, but in our country, it's a major problem. Um, for the last 15 years, it's gotten worse. The epicenter of that crisis is in the state that I currently practice in. And so we see many, many patients with active endocarditis, and these patients oftentimes are emaciated. They have, they're, they're very thin and malnourished. Uh, it's very sad. And doing a sternotomy in those patients, you can imagine the risks of sternal wound infection and breakdown and problems. So we have gone to actually, in, in selected cases of isolated mitral, tricuspid, endocarditis, to actually ap approaching these also robotically. This is an example. This is a 19-year-old unfortunate uh, woman who had uh, acute bacterial endocarditis and actually a small stroke. Um, she was approximately 30, 38 kilos, maybe something like that, very small. And so the most important principle of any surgical infection is to first debride all devitalized and infected tissue. In this case, the leaflet and the annulus didn't have time to dilate like in traditional manners. And so in this case, this is a, a radical sliding valvuloplasty that we're performing. But in, in this case, we had to do some annular reduction because of the defect that did occur. So 
this isn't complicated. This is building upon all of the skill sets that you've learned in your training and you will learn in your surgical experience. And in this case, I did do interrupted compression sutures instead of the compression suture at the level of P2, just to reduce the annulus somewhat. Once the sliding valvuloplasty is, is completed, then the leaflet valvuloplasty is completed again in interrupted techniques, and you can see the co-optation before even a ring has been placed. A remodeling annuloplasty ring is placed with interrupted sutures. Now you can use uh, uh, hand, tying them individually, but this is an, an example of the completed repair. And that's the pre-dismissal uh, echocardiogram. This is another example of endocarditis, and this time, um, for whatever reason, it's very common that the endocarditic lesion rests at this commissure. This is a patient that had bad acute endocarditis, as you can see, but also an annular abscess. And so even this is doable because of the direct vision that can be attainable, provided you follow the same surgical principles. Once it's completely debrided, in this case, we're using a technique that we've uh, termed as a bridging patch technique. And many of these videos are already published online, but this is by bridging the defect with autologous pericardium. Particularly since this is unsupported um, uh, area with an annular abscess, we've had to resect the whole commissural leaflet as well as part of A3 and a part of P3. And this allows that bridging as you patch it. And by doing so, allows for competence. It becomes actually an extra leaflet, if you will. And you can see that this is achievable, again, once you've crossed the learning curve of the standard P2 resections and sliding valvuloplasty. These types of things are readily doable with generally good anatomic results, as you can see from the echo. Now, what about once you've achieved all that, then you get a little, you, you approach things in a different way. In our institution, because we have a wonderful team and the robotic approach is relatively standard, that we then start to apply things to even more complicated patients. I'm not suggesting that this is something that should be done tomorrow or that you um, strive to uh, aspire to do these at all. I'm just saying what might be possible. This is a patient who's 62 years old, presented to the ER with an acute ST elevation marker and infarction with a acute right corneal lesion that got stented as well as a circumflex lesion. Four days later, he developed severe mitral regurgitation. However, he was fairly stable. He was not in cardiogenic shock. So he was transferred from another institution and sure enough, he had fully revascularized. He was on antiplatelet um, therapy, but of course he had a papillary muscle rupture. And so even in this situation, robotic repair is possible. I would not suggest this to be done tomorrow, but if the anatomy is favorable and safety can be assured, then what I'm suggesting is that, that any pathology, as long as, it, as, this, as we, one thinks it's safe, can be addressed including secondary mitral insufficiency, such as this case with a ruptured papillary muscle. This patient did very well and was discharged on the fifth postoperative day. Some of the most difficult cases are ones with severe mitral annular calcification. As some of you in training and perhaps in early faculty years may have seen these can be the some of the most uh, complicated cases to be done in uh, mitral surgery. 
because we're also a transcatheter mitral referral center, this is a patient that um, was referred on home oxygen, bad COPD, um, uh, really poor FEV1. Um, we were questioning if she would tolerate any type of operation and she was referred for transcatheter therapy for a transcatheter mitral valve replacement. However, at this time, there was no technology that would be feasible because of her anatomy. And so we were faced with a, a problem on whether she would even tolerate a sternotomy. This is her echo. You can see she had severe regurgitation, but also severe stenosis based on this very rigid mitral endocalcification. You can see the 3D images there. We decided to approach her robotically. Now, this needs a very careful table side associate in this case, my partner, Dr. Larry Way, and we were able to do a full resection and clean this all up. We have this sucker. We we'll also use the, this CUSA device, which is an ultrasonic device that can help soften the, the mitral angle of calcification. And, and no, we didn't repair this patient. Um, this is a replacement, but we we'll utilize the anterior leaflet to bring this over as a patch and patched the anterior leaflet to the posterior leaflet over the defect. And making sure that complete removal of all particulate matter is performed and then performing a tissue valve replacement, which is quite easy to do in a robot case. This patient also did quite well and was discharged in seven days. So as I wrap up, I wanted to leave you with a few key concepts on advanced techniques in that as one approaches increasing complexity, you have to maintain quality. But just because it's a new technique or a novel technique, it doesn't mean that certain people must be excluded, provided you've crested the learning curve. You have to have an excellent heart team with excellent imaging. We, you have to review interventional as well as surgical options, and then target the balance between maximum efficacy and minimum morbidity. In other words, for the 19-year-old that really has was emaciated and body weight minimal, a sternotomy would be effective, but it would be highly morbid in that situation. In this complex elderly woman we just mentioned, we could do a sternotomy much of valve replacement and deal with the MAC, but a sternotomy would pretty, be pretty morbid in that lady and she might have needed a trach. Um, because of her bad lungs and her ability to come off the ventilator. So if it's also anatomically appropriate for peripheral perfusion, elderly or even frail patients should not, in my opinion, should not be denied minimally invasive or robotic mitral surgery. In fact, I'd submit to all of you that, again, once one crosses the learning curve, it may be this exact subgroup, these patients that are frail and elderly, that actually could stand to benefit the most from minimally invasive and robotic approaches. Now, how does one plan for advancing complexity? In your program or in your institution or team, you should have a guide because all planning for cases in complex mitral valve disease start not in the operating room. It should never start there. It starts preoperatively with a, a detailed pathoanatomic, uh, pathoanatomic assessment of the mitral anatomy. We've introduced this grid, this grading system from one through four that looks at the pathoanatomic features along with the repair options. And as one advances, you can 
kind of parallel that to the techniques one can utilize. And this might be of use as you go through your training and in your early career stage to know how to be best prepared. I'll give you a few examples. In a simple P2 resection, such as grade one, when you have a focal P2 flail, the operative procedures can be fairly straightforward, such as a focal resection or just a neocord and a ring. Usually that focal resection is a triangular resection. As you go to more advanced disease, such as the first case we showed that had diffuse posterior leaflet disease or form frust disease, usually a small resection is not likely not enough because you have um, multiple clefts between segments that either can be closed primarily or be identified preoperatively uh, and intraoperatively. And that can be either multi-segment cords or in this case, a sliding valvuloplasty. In grade three disease, that's when you have a lot of pathology or Barlow's disease, true Barlow's, when it's diffuse bileaflet disease with anterior and posterior leaflet disease and maybe focal mitral annular calcification. And that uses all of the earlier techniques, including coral transfer and focal calcium resections uh, that become fairly advanced uh, to utilize, but is all very doable. And then the most complex are those with rheumatic disease, um, severe type 3B disease, severe MAC, or leaflet perforations or abscesses or endocarditis. And that's where you have to bring to bear multiple different types of techniques, including the uses of patches um, and significant debridement. So the most important thing is that you're safe but also successful, not for the immediate operative procedure, but for a minimum of one year, if not the life of the patient. You wanna focus on minimizing acute intraoperative morbidity, the complexities of, of passive rewarming of the right ventricle and poor venous drainage. That's a, a common early error. That's why drainage is so very important. Stroke through peripheral cannulation strategies, with good imaging and peripheral malperfusion syndromes. Uh, these are the, probably the most lethal and, and issues that are so, uh, associated, not for the robot or the minimally invasive approach, but because of the platform of a mini thoracotomy. It includes experience in complex mitral valve repair. So please be experienced or at least gain some experience through your education or your early clinical um, practice. It then requires experience with cardiopulmonary bypass and minimally invasive right thoracotomy approach. Again, start with direct vision, video assistance, and have experience with uh, peripheral cannulation. It absolutely must require excellence in imaging, both preoperatively and intraoperatively, with excellent echocardiographic imaging as well as CT availability preoperatively but I can't stress this enough is why you need good imaging in the OR because you don't want to be surprised when you're uh, doing this minimally invasive or robotically. And finally, to round out the team excellence in the OR, we always talk about heart teams that are around a boardroom and have multiple people talking, but this is your interoperative heart team. And that must include excellent anesthesia as well as perfusion. With that, one can embark on a successful minimally invasive or complex robotic repair program, first for the beginning, but then advancing your, your complexity while maintaining quality. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. It was an excellent lecture. Uh, now we have with us also Professor Rodrigo Ribeiro, Professor, are you there? Yes, Marshall, I'm here. Okay, please feel, feel yourself comfortable to do your, your concerns. Uh, nice to meet you, Professor Bedwar. Um, excellent presentation. Uh, I think uh, your 
vision of a uh, complex program of mitral valve repair is absolutely accurate. And um, we here have uh, one step down uh, uh, besides you, um, a program that uh, we are still in the uh, view thoracoscopy, uh, mitral valve repair. <clears throat> in the last two years, we have done almost 40 cases uh, with 98.9 .9, uh, success rate. So even, even in complex uh, situations like this one, this one that uh, you have shown us, uh, so, um, it was very nice to see your experience and it's very inspiring, not for, uh, only for us, but for all the youngsters that, uh, have seen it presented to, uh, by you. Uh, congratulations again. Professor, uh, can, you, can you stop your sharing just for us to see you? Very good. How's that? Okay. Great. Yeah. Nice. Well, congratulations on your program. Um, I've gotten to know many of your colleagues and many of you are excellent surgeons and excellent minimally invasive surgeons. So congratulations on your step. And I know that we are actually actively training some uh, Brazilian surgeons, perhaps even in the robot. We, we have, we've invited many people to our institution even, and I would invite all of you, maybe not all at the same time, um, to, to come and, and Happy to help you, but uh, congratulations on your program. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I do have a couple of questions from social media. The first one that, that arrived is, where do they apply to do a fellowship in your team? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can apply, in fact, I, I, I have a mitral, advanced mitral fellow, so that's for a surgeon that has already graduated. Um, has finished their training that they already can operate. Um, they can come and apply. Uh, they do have to have EC FMG to be able to get a license in our state. But once they do that, then, um, you know, we, we're looking, in fact, I'm looking um, now, not everybody should apply tomorrow, but uh, <laughs> you have a spot for someone for next year, but for a, a very technically competent surgeon, because we give them a lot of independence. But that's one pathway. But we also have a full training program in adult cardiothoracic surgery as well. But that's through the usual matching process in the United States. Okay. Great. Uh, another question that arrived is about uh, rheumatic patients. This is really prevalent in our context. Like you have issues with endocarditis, mm -hmm. with IV drug users. We have a lot of issues with rheumatic patients. And looking at the, the paranatomic complexity score that you show, they are, at least from my understanding, the most complex patients. And for us would be where, uh, where we have the pool of patients to start. So how do you think we'll, we will deal with that? And what, what are your concerns about that? So um, for rheumatic patients, that complexity grading score was for repair. So if your intention is to do rheumatic repair robotically or minimally invasive, as I'm sure all of you know, that's not the easiest thing to do, even in a astronomy patient, astronomy approach. And I do do robotic repair. But if you're going to do peeling and patching and all this thing in a robot, that's probably not the first thing you do. <laughs> However, if it's a replacement, this is a very straightforward technique. You're staring right at the valve. Yeah. And so, in fact, for isolated valve replacements, we don't do sternotomies anymore, unless there's this very specific reason they need a cabbage or something else. And so uh, for mitral valve replacement, as you saw when I gave you that example, if that's to be done, mechanical or tissue valve, um, you can do a full, you know, both cords, anterior and posterior leaf cord sparing replacement, fairly straightforward. It's repair that's a little difficult. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, just, I just received some analytics from our team and we had 72 views in our presentation, at least my ex 
expected is by the end of the week we will achieve 500 views on our video. Does anyone have any other questions? Uh, I actually do. Uh, you said about uh, comp uh, the association of uh, mitral valve, robot uh, robotic mitral valve surgery um, in combining procedures. Uh, can you tell me more about your experience using the robotic uh, robotic platform? <clears throat> I'm asking because um, uh, we we developed we developed um, uh, a stage uh, actually a program. Is it, is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> then we do uh, almost everything uh, using the the video platform, uh, including cabbages. Uh, and uh, we're actually now doing combined procedures, uh, actually like um, mitral valve replacement associated with cabbage or uh, minimally invasive uh, video assisted uh, or, or totally endoscopic uh, aortic, valve, aortic valve replacements associated with uh, cabbage, mixed cabbage. Uh, and can you tell me if you, if you do think like this uh, using the robotic platform? So, I mean, that's a very interesting question and, and, a, and a very interesting and exciting use of minimally invasive techniques. I do, I agree. My comments would be that that's not for everyone. Yes. And particularly for your trainees that are out there and, and actually many surgeons around the world, that's in a very specialized group of people. And when I make comments publicly like this, it's really about safety first yes. um, and not uh, uh, bravado or, uh, you know, uh, doing it just because you can. Now, if you can do it and you have great outcomes, and again, like we saw it, said in our discussion today, if you can do things and you can maintain quality at or better quality doing it minimally invasive, but never less quality, then anything you can do would be great. Um, you know, some programs do uh, mini right anterior thoracotomy, aortic valve, and, and ascending aortic replacement, right? If you can see it and you can do it, then that's great. In our experience, uh, we do do a, a lot of minimally invasive aortic valve operations. We have not done robotic-assisted ro aortic valves and mitral valves, but quite routinely, we very routinely, including just a few hours ago, um, we do uh, robotic-assisted full surgical ablation, biatrial Cox maze four operations. Uh, in our experience, we use cryo because it facilitates the robotic platform quite easily, combined with mitral valve surgery and tricuspid valve surgery. So it's fairly routine to do a mitral tricuspid maze, a biatrial. Um, that's in terms of combined procedures, that's something that's quite common for us to do. We have not embarked on doing a, though many have asked us to do it, to do a robotic mitral and then flip them over to the other side and do a, a robotic a lima to the LAD. Okay. Um, only for efficiency purposes and safety, uh, we have not decided to go that path. Okay. But uh, I, I, I look forward to seeing your outcomes from your experience, but um, for us, we've try to keep it simple. We, we do about 1,100 open heart operations, so we don't want to tie up one OR for the whole day. <laughs> so that's really because I put my manager hat on. We <laughs> are doing everything. So um, if, but there's lots of patients to, to receive these cases. In fact, we're, we're booked for a while for them. So we, we are targeting our advancements. Okay, uh, uh, just for, uh, for uh, <clears throat> another point, uh, you said about uh, combined mitral and tricuspid procedures using your body platform. Uh, have you done uh, both uh, double valve like aortic and mitral using a the robotic system? Aortic and mitral we have not done. Okay. But mitral and tricuspid is, is fairly okay. regular. Oh, okay, okay. And when you do this kind of combination, do you use uh, uh, <clears throat> a separate access for the right atrium? Or you do this using the, the transeptal? Uh, no, it's separate access. Uh, so yeah. uh, I, we don't do this transeptal. There's, as you can see from the robotic videos, there's no need to do transeptal. Yeah. In fact, it would be harder to do a transeptal. Yes, I, I agree. It's very hard. 
So it's two separate incisions. So if you think about the Cox Mace 4 procedure, um, it's done through two separate incisions, the vertical atriotomy. You may have seen some things we've published lately on, on the techniques and that type of thing. Um, but it lends a direct visualization of the tricuspid valve. Yeah. And so it's right through the same maze incision. And you can do the tricuspid with a beating heart. You can, however, um, in the robot technique, it's a little bit difficult. So we usually keep the heart arrested for it. It doesn't take very long. Okay. Uh, another point is uh, a few, a few um, uh, industries are like stores and uh, they are doing the, a few um, models of uh, video uh, systems using the 3D technology. Have you used one of them? Uh, the 3D glasses? Yes. And Yes, yes, the dual the dual channel uh, optics. Yeah, I mean that's essentially what the robot does, right? It's full three D visualization, um, and so that's that's even one. If you remember that picture I showed with the um, the gradation with the arrow, yes, yeah, you, know, you could probably then be between video assistants and robots, you can insert three D glasses. <laughs> the spot there for the three D glasses. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Have you used it? I've done it in prototype development before. I've seen them, and but I've not used it in live cases. Okay. You remember, um, if you go back in the history in the early 1990s, there was a thing called ESOP, which is one of the earliest robots. Yes. yes. We did use these big glasses to do that. So um, it was many, many years ago, and now it's coming back again. But um, Just like the one of the movies. Yeah, the one of the movies. <laughs> Okay. Professor Bedouard, uh, actually, this is not a question, it's uh, just an opinion. Uh, I'm finishing my residency right now, and I can, I think I can say for all the residents, uh, what can really make us anxious today is this pressure to be the, the surgeon of the future, you know, uh, to, to observe all these new technologies and We've, we feel that we need to go through this way, we need to, to, to apply these new technologies, but as you show today, there is a long pathway. There is a long way between our first training and a complex robotic approach. Can you say some words for the residents? Yes, I mean, I think that's a very, a good comment and it's very important comment and that's why everything I said today was about safety first and being a good competent open sternotomy surgeon there's nothing anybody should be embarrassed about doing a sternotomy mitral valve operation it's very very important for every resident to know we all have done that um, you know and I think Anybody that says, oh, you've got to do minis right away. Now, it it's always has to be safe first. Now, for the residents, there is a lot of discussion from cardiology and this that, oh, everything's got to be with a catheter and you're not going to have a job anymore. There is, our population is growing. It's not slowing. And our surgical trainees are limited. Everybody's going to have a job. Don't worry too much. Now, I know in Brazil, there's a lot of population and there's a lot of people that are not retiring. And I, I understand the market there very well, having been there several times. And there's different dynamics, uh, the private pairs, the private clinics, the, the hospitals. But you have very good training in Brazil. And you're all very good surgeons. And um, you will have a job. You have a very populous country. But the important thing before you innovate, be technically excellent. Pursue excellence as the first thing in your training and in your first two years of practice, be safe, get great outcomes. You do that, you will get the volume, people refer you cases, and then you innovate. Unless you have excellent training right from the beginning and, and it's comfortable for you, if that's routine for you after a couple extra years or whatever time, then that's a different story. But never feel pressured to do something that you're not, you can't execute 
a safe operation like it was a family member. Yes. Just one important thing to point, Professor, uh, your words are very precise. Uh, and um, we should never forget that uh, even it's uh, uh, statistically low, we do have a chance of conversion in this kind of surgery. So safety first, of course. And uh, so we need to be outstanding uh, sternotomy surgeons. And then, as you said, <clears throat> try to be uh, as good as we can, uh, minimally invasive surgeons. And one thing that I say, uh, used to say to my residents is that minimally invasive surgery is great for the patient, but it takes the pain away from the patient and puts it on the surgeon. Yeah. So we need to uh, be prepared to receive this kind of pain. Yeah, I think that's an important, but we use the same uh, language as well uh, about pain transference. However, once you've even passed that painful period, it can become very routine. Yes. The robot is an expensive pair of DeBakey's and Metzenbaum scissors and very expensive. And, but once you know how to use it, you use it like anything else. Yes. And so it's not to be, it's not to say that, uh, you know, it's a routine thing for everybody. No, I'm not saying that at all, but <coughs> don't be afraid of it. You can embrace the technology, but in a safe way. And so most importantly, even if it's sternotomy, when you train residents as we do, the most important thing is every move you make, make sure you know how to get out of it, right? Is that if you have a trainee doing a case at a, a root replacement, for example, making sure you can fix any problem that that person has. And when you're an independent surgeon, uh, Marcio, for your colleagues, is at the moment you exit and you begin operating, make sure that if you embark on a case, that you could always get yourself out of trouble. That's the mark of a safe surgeon. Outstanding. Davi? So I, I think we don't have any more questions and we are overstaying our, our welcome with Dr. Hadwa. But I would just like to thank you. I think this was one, one of the best uh, virtual meetings of the year and that's the that's what we are receiving in the social media. And I think this, just be ready to receive some applications from Brazil after that lecture. <laughs> I will say that, you know, the, this type of uh, interchange, I would applaud all of you for putting this together because this type of educational uh, communication is something that um, all members of our global societies believe in and on behalf of both the STS uh, and the AATS, uh, you know, these are the types of endeavors that we really uh, think are very important. And uh, the AATS uh, exchange of ideas will come to Brazil again in May of 2020. And I, I've been in communication with uh, Dr. Uh, Rio Almeida and many of your colleagues um, to put on this meeting in Porto Alegre, which will happen uh, prior to the Brazilian Society meeting. So if any of you should be attending that meeting, I, I look forward to seeing you in person. We will be there. <laughs> Professor, thank you for your time. Thank you for your lecture. And also thank you for your kind words. I, I hope you have a nice week. And thank you again for all this time. My pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.